Hello, and welcome to the Natural State Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Anthony Gustin. It is my belief that the natural state of any living organism is health, and that our artificial habitat has forced us into having artificial health problems. This show is my attempt to dive deep and learn about using nutrition, sleep, movement, relationships, and more to help you reclaim your natural state of health in a modern world and show you how to thrive in an environment that's stacked against you. If you enjoyed today's show, you can find out more details and information at DrAnthonyGustin.com. My guest this week is the wonderful Anya Fernald, who is the founder and CEO of Belcampo, one of the largest regenerative ranching operations in the country. They have restaurants, butcher shops, they sell their products online at Belcampo.com. And this week we chat about the confusion between grass-fed and regenerative, why we got to such a messed up food system in the first place, the future of meat, our food system distribution, and more. So tune in and I hope you enjoy this episode. This show is brought to you by Alatra Naturals. When I considered sponsors for this show, I reached out to Andy, who is the founder of Alatra, and pretty much begged him to support the show just because they are the only products that I trust to put on my skin. So much garbage is in skincare products that it blows my mind. I cannot find any other products. I do not put anything else on my body other than Alatra. It's actually a lie. I use White Oak Pastures beef tallow soap in the shower. But other than that, everything sort of pre post around that is Alatura. And if you don't know why, your skin is the largest organ in your body. It absorbs everything you put on it. And men are less known for using sort of skincare products, but women average over 250 chemicals that are in their bloodstream from their skincare products by the time they walk out the door in the morning. That is ridiculous. Uh, I personally use the moisturizer, the clay mask in my sauna, and the pearl cleanser. My fiance uses way more. She has a little bit more of a skincare routine than I. And the products themselves are made with the highest end ingredients that you would ever find in skincare products. This stuff's incredible. Andy himself is a testament how these products work. He's been on the podcast before to tell his story, but it was amazing. He was in a horrific accident. His face got all mangled up and he basically made this formula to heal his scars. And he is now a male model. That is not a joke. He has incredible skin and is obsessed with the quality of his ingredients in the sourcing of them. He was just in Hawaii recently sourcing one ingredient of the many that are in one of his products. This guy goes, visits every single farm and product, and it is incredible. The quality you get here is by far the best in the industry. And so I begged him to sponsor the show and also begged him to give you guys a little bit of a hookup. So if you use code AG20, you'll get 20% off in free shipping over at alatura.com. That's A-G-2-0 at A-L-I-T-U-R-A to get 20% off your order at alatura.com. That's A-G-20 at A-L-I-T-U-R-A.com. You get 20% off in free shipping of your entire order. Again, I use the Pearl Cleanser. I, again, I use the Pearl Cleanser in the moisturizer. They are phenomenal. This show is also brought to you by Blue Blocks, blue light blocking glasses. Blue light is one of these things that a lot of people do not realize is completely trashing their sleep. So this is verified, at least for me. I looked at my aura ring and anytime I get blue light exposure from devices past say 4 p.m., the latency, the time it takes me for me to fall asleep, as well as my deep sleep are completely diminished. And when I wear glasses like blue blocks, it completely reverses that and I can get a full rested sleep with no problem. There are a lot of brands out there right now that are trying to get on this trend of blocking blue light for good reason. And what happens is most of them are either really cheap and they break super easily. They are terrible looking and make you look like a freaking goon or they actually just don't work. So I've tried some out that, you know, are sort of a spectrum of any of these things all the way to being so dark that I get headaches from wearing them. And what I like about Blue Box is it sort of addresses all of these things. So they're made actually in Australia, really, really high quality stuff. They have 20 plus different styles of each one. So no matter what sort of style fits your head and your face, my face is sometimes a little tough to make look good. So I'm glad they have options for me. But also they test all of their lenses to make sure that they meet specific criteria to block very specific wavelengths of light. 
And this is the important part here. Not a lot of brands do this. And so I've actually tested there side by side. I mean, you can do this as easily as just looking at a spectrum of blue and you put on their glasses and you can't see the blue anymore. It goes completely black or it has a shade of a gray. And this is what you want. And these guys who have done this company have done a phenomenal job at really sourcing the highest quality lenses, highest quality frames, and the ones that actually look good. So I'm not embarrassed when I put these on in public. And I asked them if they could hook you guys up and they obliged. So 15% off is yours if you use code AG15. Also, you get free shipping. So if you want to, just head to B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com and use code AG15. That's blueblocks.com. Use code AG15 for 15% off and free shipping. Anya, thank you for thank you for coming on the show today. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I've wanted to chat with you for a long time, but you know all the stuff. We have all these like side conversations that are get very deep really quickly, and I'm super excited to bring you on the show and sort of have a formal way to dive into some of these topics. Dig it! I'm looking forward to it. So, I mean, I think it's just starting with your background. Very interesting, and uh, not like most people who are in agriculture. So, I'm just curious, sort of like. Growing up, not a very standard uh, situation with that as well. So maybe just one o'clock back into your early years and chat a little bit about that. Yeah, I grew up in an academic family. My parents are both professors and um, their careers took them to interesting places. So I got an interesting kind of exposure. I was actually born on a raw milk dairy in Bavaria where I lived till I was about three. Um, and uh, that was because my father was doing his postdoctoral work in, in Germany. Um, so their careers got them kind of moving around to a lot of different places. And I lived in London as a kid and in um, Eugene, Oregon. Um, and eventually we settled in, in California. Uh, where I where I went to high school, and uh, I you know I just got an exposure to food I think as an eater, um, and I got into cooking I'd say really as a way to um, a kind of soothe myself. I tend to be pretty like high activity and need a lot of engagement and a lot to do. I'm a very active person, and I liked cooking because it kind of calmed my nerves, and I would have really good, interesting thoughts and good perspectives on things. If I can keep myself sort of busy with my body, my mind goes in a way that people enjoy exercise as well. And I do too, right? So that was part of it. Another part of it was cooking fascinated me because I, I could also really help my family as a, as a young girl. Um, my mom would always get incredibly anxious around cooking and food prep. And, and I really remember the first time that like Thanksgiving kind of went off the rails because she became really overwhelmed. Um, like many very like academic people, my mom is like functions very, very well on one track, <laughs> but she's not, I'm kind of an ATV, like in terms of my brain. Um, my mom is more of a Ferrari, right? Needs a smooth road, but can go very fast. Um, so I kind of was able to dive in and help my family. I think as a child, you know, that's kind of one of the big, one of the big things in your life is right. How do I fit in here? How do I help? Um, and I, I got into cooking. I loved um, preparing food. I loved the joy that I could bring to people. I love gathering people together. And I also love the ability to kind of control my my health. You know, I think I realized um, as a kid with some of the travel and exposure, just that eating is one of the the fundamental acts of of, of owning your body and, and taking care of yourself and of healing and of wellness. Did, you, did your parents help you realize that or something you just sort of observed from the world around you? It kind of came from my own travels. I was pretty adventurous. And I, you know, when I, I left for college and then I immediately semi kind of dropped out halfway through my sophomore year. Um, again, I'm, I come from academic stock, but I'm not like the most stellar academian. And I, I went to Wesleyan University in Connecticut and I did an honors program and halfway through my sophomore year, I was like kind of bonked and I went and I became a baker. Um, and I worked um, in a dude ranch in Montana as a baker. And then I, um, you know, took the money that I earned from that. And I spent about four months in, in Greece um, studying traditional baking, just visiting. I don't know quite where I chose Greece. It's not famous for its bread, but it certainly was a great place to learn our really artisan old-fashioned baking at the time. You know, we're talking like um, mid-90s, late-90s. And I... So I'd say that was one of the first places where I had that real like health food connection was traveling around Greece by myself on a shoestring, um, you know, visiting with small families and traditional, you know, small scale bakeries and eating just a different style of food. 
Um, I don't, my parents are not in there. They take care of themselves, but they're not manifestly sort of healthy or interested in that, in the wellness connection with food. What I just noticed was that coming off of a kind of standard American diet, um, not being particularly hip to where food came from, that time in Greece got me tuned into it. From there, I you know went back. I did graduate from college, and I immediately went back to Europe. And this time, I was um, more in a more formal way studying cheese making. I got a fellowship to fund me. They gave me twenty thousand dollars to live on for a year um, of travel. When the the mandates of this fellowship, you have to stay abroad and study something you can't study in traditional channels. So I wanted to study cheese making because I had been baking a lot, and then I was very interested in traditional American baking. And traditional American baking is predicated on the use of a lot of whey, which is a byproduct of the dairy industry and byproduct of cheese making, and also buttermilk. So I began making cheese just to produce my own whey so I could make traditional American breads. And then um, from there, started making cheese. And I'm like, oh, this is actually more fun and interesting. So I started to make cheese in college at home. You know, like in my dorm room, I was like, I'm making cheese and my college roommate still teases me about it. we'd always have like bags of way of cheesecloth hanging from the coat rod of our closet, dripping into a bowl on the bottom of the closet to collect the whey. And so I was just like, I was kind of very much doing my own thing. Um, but I was also very athletic. I rode crew. I was, um, you know, in, in, in that kind of like trying to experimenting, you know, I tried doing high protein at the time, but I didn't really have access to clean ingredients. But I'd noticed in that time in Greece that my body felt different. I felt better, vibrant, engaged, alive. And when I moved to Europe to study cheesemaking, similar type of transformation, you know, I went from, um, you know, living on the college campus to, to living in a dairy farm first in Wales. And then I went to Italy, North Africa, and eating a very, very high fat, high protein diet, a traditional, you know, animal based diet that you eat when you work as a cheesemaker on a small rural dairy in pretty much anywhere in Europe. Also lots of wild foods, wild herbs, especially when I was working in Italy. Um, and I loved the way I felt. Uh, I also loved like the sensuality of food and health. Like I loved learning to smell, you know, learning to smell for health, like learning to taste things. And it sounds like kind of basic now because I think these tools are more kind of like more widely available. People talk about them, I think mostly because of the wine industry. But you, you, you really learn to taste olive oil and to talk about all the different flavors of it. The appreciation you get for that, you know, that and the sort of visceral enjoyment you get from it, but also the fact that you're tapping into your own body's intuition about what it needs to heal it. So when you start to really take apart flavor and take apart taste and eliminate any kind of mindless eating from your life, uh, you will actually, I think, really change your own health. If you start to be able to very much, you know, kind of engage with what does it smell like? What is it? What do I crave about this? I do this now to this day. Um, and this is the kind of thing I, I learned a lot in in that time in my life is just smelling food before I eat it and and thinking about like, does this appeal to me right now? You know, in the, in the US, we talk about cravings and like desires in food typically in a compulsive way. You know, it's like typically in this box of like cravings are bad. If they're cravings, it's like for nachos and other crap. Um, cravings are actually can be amazing for your health. Cravings can be your body's language of, of what it needs to heal it. So learning to pay attention to, to me, I look at the, you know, the, the traditional Italian way of where I lived. Um, eventually, I moved to Sicily where I got a full-time longer-term job. And then from there, lived in northern Italy where I also worked in animal agriculture and in agriculture in general. So I spent about a, a stretch of seven years in total in mostly in Italy in that time working in agriculture so, yeah, and starting yeah. out as a cheesemaker. So, I mean, one of the things too, before you go further, I think that it was really important. I think when looking at smelling and tasting food, I think that you are on a sort of this track of eating real food. This just doesn't apply to a lot of people when they're eating Doritos and then trying to have a normalized palate, both from taste and smell. I think yeah. that people just concept of like what the base reality of food actually is, not things that are edible that you can just chew and swallow but things that are nourishing that naturally exist in our environment. Mm -hmm. Like there's sometimes I have dinners and I have people over and it's like, they've never had fresh basil before, for example, mm. which is mm -hmm. insane. And I think like, they're like, or like arugula and they go, well, why is it so spicy? Like I can't even eat this. And I, I think just the frame of reference to real food gets so distorted by eating sort of all the fake and manufactured food that we do have now. That's very true. Yeah. One of the things that was, really <laughs> touching 
that I learned at that time, I, I worked with a group called Slow Food and the founder of Slow Food is a very charismatic guy and, and he would give talks um, to, to groups of kids and the, the Italian system, they're you know very interested in this. It's a big part of their culture and, and they were losing it, right? Like they, they continue to lose that aspect. But I remember one of the biggest um, surprises to me is he would give talks to like, you know, a couple hundred kids in elementary school and say, okay, here's two jars of jam. One is like a grandma's homemade jam and one is a commercial like American style jam. And um, you're going to do a blind taste test and, and let me know which one you like better and ever, which one do you think you're going to like better? And the answer was always like the homemade grandma jam, right? And then they would taste the two and invariably choose the commercial jam um, because, you know, you think you're going to like the natural one. But in reality, especially if you're a kid, the, the amount of sugar is just going to overwhelm the other aspects of your sensory capacity, right? So a lot of times it takes some coaching to kind of learn what, how to appreciate real flavors. I think if you're on a Frito diet and you start to say, great, I'm going to try to get healthy, you're not going to enjoy a kale salad or whatever it might be. It's just, you, you, have, to, you have to reteach your palate. And I, 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 we've all got it in us. Like we have a palate that can let us heal ourselves. We didn't used to have medicine. We used to just use food to heal. And, it, you know, in studies of animals, it's amazing. They'll... Um, studies of goats and sheep, they've documented time and time again, when they have an, an outbreak of an intestinal parasite, those animals will e eat exclusively bitter herbs. They'll heal themselves with food. You know, they'll use an, a natural antimicrobial. They'll eat abundant antimicrobial. You know, the bitterness is, is a toxic, can be a sign of a toxic ingredient for, the, for the, whatever is disturbing your stomach. So we have that capacity in us. We're hardwired for it, but we've learned to override it by that really heavy sugar, salt, fat, um, you know, triangle that like that, that, that combination is what we're taught to go for. And in doing that, we're overriding our hunger and our recognition of what are, are called secondary satiety characteristics. And secondary satiety characteristics are what your body is hungry for that's not just calories. So when you are, are looking at what are those what does that really mean, right? Satiety is being full. The secondary characteristics is beyond the just calorie needs that you have of somewhere between 12 and 2,500 calories a day you need. Your barley also has a satiety need for vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, other things, right? We all have the ability through our hunger to seek those things. And a lot of times this compulsive hunger that people have when they eat a lot of processed food, isn't that they're just don't have willpower, it's that their secondary satiety characteristics are not getting met. Right. And so this like has been the protein leverage hypothesis is also people will eat, you know, until they get enough protein, but then same thing for micronutrients as well. Um, that again, is just like you said, is like so difficult to do when your body's calibration system of what's actually going in is so messed up. Exactly. When you are not getting appropriate nutrition from your food, doesn't matter how many calories you get, you're going to keep on eating. And this is, um, you know, something that is, it's also, it's a mashup with hyperpalatability. We, I'm sure you're familiar with the studies that show that, you know, you eat on average 500 more calories a day with your eating processed foods compared to whole foods. And you'll do that regardless of your, your perception of fullness is the same in those two, but you'll eat 500 calories more. And that's part of that's the hyperpalatability. So you're eating more because it's sugary and, and you don't have to chew as much and there's less fiber. But it's also the secondary satiety piece is, is a really interesting characteristic that I think is a big part of the kind of obesity puzzle, right? It's not just about hitting the kind of macros. There's other stuff that your body's looking for. And the most interesting data around this that I've come across is people um, getting satiety sooner when they eat heritage varieties. So people, there's experience of fullness sooner when you're eating like the broccoli rob compared to the broccoli, because those have far more minerals and vitamins in them. Uh, so it's a, you know, if you look at like what changes or what have we given up in processed foods, part of it, the thing we focus on is like that there's a lot of additives, right? But the other thing, the additives are compensating for a lack of what's going into the pipeline. So the actual base ingredients that are being used are less nutritionally dense on every level, level despite having the same number of calories, and therefore aren't going to give your body the, the comprehensive nutrition it needs. So broccoli is not broccoli, 
right? And so if you're you're looking at what is processed food doing, they're adding in more things to create that satiety because you're getting less of it from these impoverished ingredients. Right. And I think that as well, it's, I mean, I think that one of the things about scaling a regenerative model, which I'm sure we'll dig into a lot, but the fact that we don't need as much food, we just need, we need more nutrition. Like we don't need mm-hmm. as many calories. We need more nutrition out of our food. Mm-hmm. And our body, I remember reading um, just the other day about, you know, a guy who'd grown up extremely poor in Mexico and was talking about how he had only eaten fruit stolen from his neighbor's trees in his childhood and, and then would also eat a lot of mud. And he said, I didn't realize why until I learned much later that I was so iron deficient that I was hungry for mud. Well, who else do you hear about being hungry for mud is, is pregnant women, right? And that's a typical, that's a, your, your, so there's your kind of deep, nutrition. It's like your deep nutrition searchlights can find the stuff that you need. Um, but we don't know how to listen for that anymore, right? We don't, we don't pay attention to that, to that need. And so you were cruising around Italy, learning how to make cheese and food in the agriculture. Yeah. And, and just like, and, and happy and balanced and like, my skin looked great and I felt great. And I was like, this is interesting. Cause I come out of the kind of low fat nineties, you know, people were, were pounding the snack wells while they were studying and their, you know, espresso shots. Like it was a different, you know, there was kind of still a little Atkins verbal out there, but it was pretty much the low fat nineties. And that's when I went to college and, and, um, and I remember people in on my, on my crew team, like pounding these like spaghetti meals where it was no fat, in the spaghetti, you know, it's like so crazy, you know, like sugary tomato sauce and tons of carbs. And so I moved, you know, when I lived abroad, I just went to this very high fat diet. And I also started um, foraging for food. I live with and work with families that grew all their own food. Um, and I just, I felt better and I was intrigued. And I was, and it also kind of scratched an itch for me because, you know, Anthony, I'd been like looking at the culinary world as a possibility for myself. Obviously, I was a passionate cook. I'd worked as a professional cook at that point and as a professional baker. And, but I didn't really vibe on the world. Like I wasn't that interested in fine dining. I wasn't like, man, I'll feel amazing if I can get a restaurant that gets like a five-star review by whoever, right? That wasn't my jam. I just didn't feel excited about that. And now in retrospect, I kind of think, you know, I'm, I'm a little, I, I look at fine dining now as almost being like hyper-processed food. You know, it's like a very fancy, very complex processed food. And I think I wasn't interested in it because I wasn't really interested in, in being that kind of like fabricator for lack of a better word, right? So I, I, I really got um, interested in, in the making of food because of the way it made me feel. And also I just was intrigued by the whole art of it and the human know-how and how it all came together and paying attention to the animals and how the animals were fed and how they were milked and and then the cool interaction with climate and place and product where people would be making, you know, where I worked in Sicily for a couple of years, it was all these cow milk cheeses where they were aged at over a hundred degrees. So the aging rooms was so damn hot in Sicily, the aging rooms would be over a hundred degrees. They didn't have refrigeration back when these cheeses, you know, were developed or evolved. And so they were processed in this very particular way that made them heat resistant. They were aged, not resting on shelves, but hung from ropes. Just so cool. Like there's a neat like window into human history. And, um, and I just sort of said, you know, I'm, I'm never going back. Like, this is it. Like, this is great. Right. I love this lifestyle. I love waking up at dawn and milking cows and being out there. And, you know, I'd gone to college and studied political science and I was kind of expected to go on a different path. Um, And of course, my parents are professors and, you know, like very, like their realm of achievement was very different than the path that I was staring down. But I, I was, I was really, um, I I just kind of stuck with it. And I ended up going into much more of a desk job and I ended up developing like a microfinance program in artisan food with Slow Food with funding they had from the European Union to make investments in small businesses in food production to help them become compliant and then also export. So I developed a kind of mini expertise in business planning and development for these smaller artisan food brands, which I've really leveraged now in my career, you know, since then. But um, it was, it was a really uh, just a, a chance to immerse myself in a different way where I, I just thought to myself, like, this is distinctly a better way than what I'm seeing at home. And I want to learn what I can from this and bring some element into my life and into whatever change I leave in the world in my own country. 
Right. And so that, that path has been very interesting and very, that's probably unpredictable from where you were in Italy to where you are now. So, I mean, like, I guess your intro to trying to help the system here, um, how did that start? What did that look like? Yeah. So I'm an entrepreneur by passion and, you know, I've been starting businesses since I was 12 when I started my first cookie business. Um, and I, I just, I came home, I was very interested in sort of the justice side of farming. I started a business that was a, a, a produce distribution business, which I ended up selling, which um, brought small, very small, mostly minority, particularly Southeast Asian farmers into a distribution network where we sold into Kaiser Permanente and um, the veterans hospitals, a couple different big school districts here in California. So that was an LLC owned by a, a nonprofit initially. And that we basically was a kind of a social venture produce distribution business. So that was my first venture. Um, from there, I ran a event called Slow Food Nation, which was a building on my career with Slow Food in Italy, a very, very large uh, event um, got me a lot of media visibility and also kind of got me some mentorship from like the CEO of Whole Foods at the time, who was just really kind of tapped me on the shoulder and said, Hey, you should, you should think about, you know, doing bigger things. And so I got some kind of a nice like kind of nudge in the right direction. And I started a, two different businesses after the event business, um, which was another events business, which I ended up selling, and then a consulting company, which has led to Belcampo, um, because my partner, my business partner in Belcampo was one of my clients for my consulting company. So I'd say I, I, I came at it from a very strong, like not, I, justice is not the fair word for it, but like I say like socially minded approach around business and business that supports quality agriculture. And in the meantime, on the side, I nurtured a lot of passions around kind of meat and animal agriculture. I've always, uh, you know, worked at some level, had a finger in animal agriculture. And I, I, when I came back to California, I had a, I eat a lot of meat. I love meat. I had a very, very strong physical reaction to my meat diet here in America. So I gained like 35, 40 pounds within three or four months when I moved back to the U S just eating what I thought was a fairly similar diet to what I'd been eating in. Good. So before. nothing had really changed. I'm sure that something changed, you know, like I'm sure some things did. I, I think it's, it can't be considered like perfect experience it's right. a, it's a experiment, you know, but it wasn't like, I'm pretty f um, fit and active and I cook all my own food, you know, and I always have. So I, it wasn't like something massively changed in my life. You know, I didn't pick up some new habit or, but it was a new job, a new country. So let's just say half of it was, you know, the, X factor of society changes and the other half was just something changed in the, in what I ate. And I'll, I will say that to bring my health back in line, which I did, you know, within two years, I, it started from meat and it started with me the following year, starting to buy whole cows myself from a producer that I worked, that I knew of because of my produce distribution business. So I bought from him directly. And I, cause I had that produce business, I would truck our beef, the beef, I buy a whole cow from it. I bring it in my refrigerated truck and I distributed it to friends. So this is in 2006. I set up the first, I think the first meat CSA in California, um, just as a kind of like, just for fun. And so I could get good product. And I also in that time started buying and distributing whole pigs. And it was a really, it was kind of social, it was fun, connect with people and get really good quality product. And in doing that, I realized it was just a little taste of how hard it, it was at the time to get differentiated high quality product in the US, right? So it was like a massive amount of kind of know-how and infrastructure and leverage needed by me to achieve that. So next step, do it yourself. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's funny. People ask me too. It's like, you know, why would you ever do like sell whole cows? And I say, no way. Because what I realized with that business or that wasn't a business, that was just for fun. But it, it's so difficult to, to, to take the whole animal and find somebody who wants every single piece of it. And that's still the problem I struggle with today at Bill Campo, right? Back, you know, it's been, <laughs> it's been 15 years, but that's still something like I had an, a meeting this morning where we were talking about just that. How do you get people to pay attention to every part of the animal? Um, but, it, you know, it's, it's been the, the, the puzzle with animal agriculture is massive and, and it's the most consolidated part of the food industry, but, you know, grocery, 
in the grocery store, I mean, there's, I would say the most because all that might be an overstatement, but compared to produce, the other fresh raw product we eat in abundance, vegetables and fruit, um, we have for vegetables and fruit with pretty minimal exertion, most Americans can get product direct from a small farm at a farmer's market. And many grocery stores have really good direct local buying programs from local farms for their fruits and vegetables, especially on, you know, on the, on the West Coast where we've got a large industry of, of, of small farms. Meat, not so much. And still to this day, not so much, right? It's very challenging to directly buy. You can do it at some farmer's markets and you can do it at very few grocery stores that get high quality, direct source, highly um, qualified and, and certified meats. So that the opportunity was so clear to me then and remains clear to me today. And why is that the case? I mean, why, why are there not good programs to bring meat in? Is it because we think meat's unhealthy and we're trying to reduce it? So just because there's such crazy monopolies in the large like Smithfields and Tysons of the world? Yeah, I mean, the monopolies are also a result of consumer patterns, right? I see the issues are primarily around the economics. It's expensive to buy enough land to raise meat, especially beef. And it's expensive and complicated to get them killed and, and processed and distributed in a way that's USDA compliant. It's a, it's a high barrier to entry. Got it. And so, I mean, when you were starting in Belcampo, is this something that you knew that you wanted to do this operation at a massive scale? I mean, your ranch is what, like 20 some thousand, 30 some thousand acres? Yeah, it's a large operation now. When we started, we had 6,000 acres. So my business partner already owned 6,000 acres. And then we started buying more land. Um, I would say, you know, the the ambition has scaled with the opportunity. Got it. And, and you know, it's like the opportunity with, when we started, it was like, let's just make this farm profitable with this group of restaurants. And then pretty quickly it became, wow, like within probably three years of starting keto and paleo and things were kind of picking up. Right. And so it became a much, much bigger um, opportunity. I started to see. And at the start of 2018, I lined out um, what I called our omni-channel vision, which was a pitch that I made to our board at the time that was like, hey, I think this could be bigger than this restaurant company. We could open up multiple channels that could and actually become a national brand for meat. So it's taken us two and a half years, but now we're, we have a reasonable deployment in grocery stores and we're growing extremely rapidly in our e-commerce channels. Yeah. And so those are two channels that you thought of as, as retail and e-com? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And- so when you guys and at the time, yeah, we weren't we were mostly interested in retail at the time. We were sort of figuring it out, honestly, you know, figuring out where where we could go. Um, but my idea was like, let's become a national meat brand, sort of by any which way of doing it. Right, and I think that for people who are unfamiliar with brands, um, you guys, I don't know if you've launched them all at the same time or sort of like how things have rolled out. But your sort of model initially of distribution was, okay, let's have these these restaurants that obviously use the meat, but also have them be sort of hybrid butcher shops as well, right? Exactly. It was a meat market with a restaurant in it. That initially, Anthony, was like, we, we opened the first door in Marin. Um, and we actually now permanently closed that location during COVID, unfortunately. But um, it, it, it's been, it was, was like- in Larkspur? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, but the, the response was like, I don't want to eat meat, eat hamburgers while I'm looking at meat. Mm-hmm. <laughs> which is like such an American response, which is like, I don't want to know where it comes from. And it's like, well, that's what got you into this mess. Right. I can say now, but you know, that's the American way. Like we don't want the chicken to look like chicken, you know, like all that was the really kids. The you got was the butcher shops too close to my food. Yeah. Oh. And I think like, that's a, you know, in other countries, that's a sign of quality people. You know, if you go to, you know, Chinese fish restaurants are the, the place you see it the most, it's like, you're going to see the animal, so you know it's clean and good, right? So in, in a more traditional approach, the more you see of the product, the more you're supposed to, you're going to feel good about eating it, right? Um, but we have a different attitude, which is like we would like it breaded and shaped like a square or turned into a processed product that's like it doesn't have any sort of like animal look or feel to it. Doesn't even, you know, like a, a lot of, I think, you know, processed meats, you could taste it. You go like, this could be turkey. It could be ham. It, it, may, it, it, it could be chicken. Like if you, if you were to go put a blindfold on and taste you know, I think 90% of deli meats, you might struggle to know which animal it even came from, like from a taste perspective and visual perspective, you know, if you notice how much 
our, I mean, this is for production conformity, but like how much of our meat is shaped like a square or a rectangle or, <laughs> or a perfect circle. You know, we try to make things look like a shape that is very much shows the domination of the natural system, right? It's like a very different approach. It's like, we want this to have nothing connected to an animal that walked around and we want it to feel like a machine product. That's the, that's the, that's the bargain or that's the request that we've, we've made of the meat industry. It's like, we don't want to know. And we've gotten a system where we absolutely don't know. You know, we've gotten what we asked for as consumers. Like we want to take away all the guilt, not by make doing it right, but by not asking or not needing to ask the questions. So, I mean, do you then find your restaurant consumers to be a very different demographic than the ones who buy for the butcher shops or direct via e com or even well, at? That's what's store? so magical. I mean, the past like eight years have been in many ways, like honestly, the hardest of my life. You know, sometimes I'll remember things that happened two years ago that feel like it was 10 years ago, right? Like it's been a very, very hard, hard march to get this company to where it is today. And it's still nowhere near where it's going to be soon. But that said, God bless the development and the work that people like you are doing to educate uh, around protein and diets and around origin as being important for our health. So there's been a huge evolution in the consumer mindset that has allowed us to rise. We started to see a different type of consumer. And it was a magical moment. I started to track this in 2016. And it was seeing these guys, this, these two guys come in. Well, there's two stories I can tell you that like I may cry because it's like, it's just like emotional moments of remember, of feeling like things were possible. And one was two guys coming into our Larkspur location and pounding like three rotisserie chickens between the two of them. And I'm like, are my rotisserie chickens are expensive, okay? So that's like an expensive lunch right there. And, and seeing that and being like, wow, if I could just get like 50 more of those guys, like things could really work here, right? And, and the great thing is that now there are 50 more of those guys, right? That trend really happened. And the other thing that happened was touching a table, which I love to do, you know, at a restaurant, our restaurant's going and just saying, hi, like I'm Anya, I'm co-founder of this company and what can I tell you about what we do and stuff. And, and hearing, um, and it was a table of older women in their probably 60s or 70s, five of them. And I said, hi, I'm Anya and that, you know, glad to, we can have you here today. And they said, oh yeah, we're here every week on whatever day it was. I said, oh great. Um, you guys is like a group or something. And then no, no, we just, this is, this meat tastes like what meat used to taste like when we were little girls. Wow. Isn't that amazing? So hearing that and saying, oh my God, there's an appetite for people recognizing A, that protein can be good and B, that this tastes different, you know? So th those moments, like I think back and it's like, oh my God, that's a moment when things were clear to me that it was possible. You know, it's possible. I, I felt for a long time that I could bring this better product to market and that fundamentally nobody was going to care. And I've felt now that in the past, especially during, even during COVID, you know, with the meat supply crisis and stuff, I'm starting to feel now like people are starting to care and connect the dots. And I feel this, like this sense of a movement around me of people who are like, I'm not going to settle. You know, I'm not going to settle when it comes to meat. I'm not going to accept meat from tortured animals, fed a maladaptive diet, kept in cages, you know, that I have no idea any aspect of where it came from. If I get sick, I get a liability payment. I don't get any information about, about the system of production, okay. right? So like that's the, that's the bargain that we're making. And I, I, was, I was waiting for the day when people would say, I'm not ready to make that compromise. And I think we're getting closer to that day now. And do you think that's driven mostly by education? I mean, th these are some of the things where I just try to think about how does this how does sort of like regenerative agriculture and doing things the right way scale to a point where it's common? I mean, is it more education, more of the market? Like there's so many different things we need to change distribution. Obviously, you know how tip, tough that can be. Where do you see the most high leverage points of sort of wedges that are open up? I mean, so the, the, the wedges for me is the, is really recent. Um, and that's the openness during COVID of people to get more types of products directly from the farmers. So the fact that we can sell direct on our website is a very, very important shift for me. Um, and sorry, you're going to hear speaking of COVID, my kids in the background. Um, but I, you know, I found a, a massive shift in people's willingness to buy direct 
and willingness to work directly, you know, with the constraints of dealing with a smaller farmer operation like us, that's been a major deal shifter for me. Game changer is the right word. And that, you know, because in, in grocery stores, we do sell in grocery stores, but keep in mind that in grocery, we our pricing is so challenging for us because we pay a distributor, a broker, and a retailer. All three of those take double digit percentages. You know this from your business. Right. This is why we're not in retail. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's a mess for uh, for basically what I've actually changed my patterns of buying now because what I've learned from being in grocery stores is that really high quality, high cost ingredients struggle to thrive. And it's actually very, very challenging to thrive. Um, so I, I've actually now look at the grocery store offering through a different lens. I now look at it through the lens of like, this may be a compromise of my values, you yeah, know, just based it, on what I know. It sort of by definition has to be cheap food. Exactly. Like, that, exactly. That's the reason why we're not in retail is because our margins, like we have such high quality products, but don't charge the same amount that other people do relative to their product costs that we just can't afford to go into retail right now unless we want to raise a bunch of money and burn through it to someday hope to get to scale points where we are then profitable. And, yeah. And it's just, it doesn't make any sense to me. And no. I mean, so obviously like shipping stuff online though is also like that mode of distribution for a frozen good, like in the cold chain is also really expensive. Uh, I mean, do you think that that's a sustainable way? It's still of- much less expensive. Got, yeah. My margins are, tr- even with free shipping, my margins are triple. And you guys should be out of here like, from your ranch or do you have distribution points that you... Yeah, we have right now we have three fulfillment centers, Got one it. of which is our own slaughterhouse. Got it. And um, I mean, do you see maybe not doing restaurants anymore, but opening up sort of more local butcher shops? Would that fix any problems if people were willing to go get like local meat? Or is it sort of like a people are just, you know, COVID gave us convenience and now we're buying everything online and it's going to stay that way? Like, what are your thoughts around that system? I'm banking on e-commerce with meat being here to stay. I'm also banking on grocery stores having to radically change as a result of COVID and a result of on-demand expectations by the consumer. Um, So now consumers need product on demand in a way that they didn't think they had that need before, right? And I think that the, the problem is these grocery stores, right? They're taking a huge chunk of our top line, Um, but they're also, their bottom line is really challenged, right? A lot of these are operating on a two or 3% bottom line net. And in that case, if their bottom line is two or 3%, when you have Instacart taking 9%, what happens? Yeah, nothing sustainable, that's for sure. So I I think the grocery model is going to have to pivot. And I'm not surprised that you know, many grocery stores, I've heard of a couple major chains trialing, shutting stores to consumers and just using them for fulfillment for Instacart so that they're shaving on staffing Same. and able to recoup that percentage. So I think that's a potential future too. Um, but I think that there's going to be a real sea change in how people shop. Um, yeah. And I think online, I also think with the number of businesses that are closing headquarters and offices permanently, or at least for a very long time, um, that there's more people at home able to receive shipments. There's that kind of deal breaker. I also think that people are going to be traveling less in general and restaurants are going to be challenged also because there is, you know, just no more expense account dining, no more any type of um, that sort of, you know, like that whole world is going to be shifting really radically. So there's a a number of trends that right now that absolutely um, affect um, everything for, for many aspects of my business. I personally have started to buy direct and I've also noticed that like, wow, I can buy way better brands for the same price that I would spend in the grocery store. So and yeah. I, I wouldn't want, I don't want to trade that for anything now. Like now that I've done that, I'm like, why would I be spending so much more for my lower quality almond butter when I can buy six jars of it direct every couple of months and I get a better quality product for the same amount of dollars. Like there's no, there's no downside. Yeah. And then the middlemen aren't getting 40% of the product cost. Uh, exactly. I mean, so for, as far as the education and people choosing and having better standards, how have you sort of navigated the minefield that is, here's what we do, here's how it's different. And like, what's the difference between grass fed and regenerative? Like, what are you doing differently? And how do you think we sort of jump over that hurdle and get to the next phase? So the challenge is that American consumers have very little bandwidth for meat. They don't pay very much attention. And 
the little attention that they've been coached to pay is kind of for the wrong things, right? So what I'm trying to do is to, in the sense that like organic is important-ish, but it's not an indicator that the product is good for the environment. It's not an indicator that the animals are kept in a way that's humane. It's not an indicator that they've been fed a diet that's appropriate for them evolutionarily that lets them thrive, right? So some of the labels that we think are really important are actually not. And so I, I, I am concerned because my consumer right now tends to be shopping based on a, a few pieces of information that are actually not really solving the problems that they're trying to shop for. And I'll, I'll take a step back to just about the consumer. This may be interesting for you that we in, in looking at my consumer, looking at people who start to buy a meat like Bel Campos meat, which costs on average twenty to thirty percent more than a, than a sort of even you know, like a Whole Foods top market product, they're typically motivated by like a major life event around health. And something we landed on early was that, or saw I see really early that one of my biggest groups of buyers is and always has been people who are recovering from cancer. So. That's a crazy thing to me, right? That you have to go through cancer to start to care about your meat. But in the medical community, right, there, in, in, people are, um, this is actually, it's been documented enough, enough, you know, different doctors in California have seen patients have fast recoveries when they're eating healthier proteins that it's become sort of standard to recommend, like, you know, clean up your protein, right? So I, there's, a, there's a really interesting piece that I've seen, which is that, it's like the biggest driver for me, for my customers, is personal health. So even though I, I want it to be about regenerative and sustainability and everything else, I'm trying as much as possible to connect the dots between animal wellness and human wellness. And the duh, no shit way of it, of like thinking about it is, well, the animal agriculture system in the U.S. is an obesogenic environment. Animals are raised to become obese very quickly. So you probably don't want to eat that if you're looking to maintain a great BMI, right? The second piece of information around this is that we share 99% of our DNA with, with these animals. And so the chemicals and, and, you know, different substances that are used to facilitate this very, very rapid gain of weight through, you know, fat and musculature, those are things that, are, that may have some more impacts on us. Right, so I'm trying to connect those dots in my language and information about what we do, just animal wellness in support of human wellness. But then I have to talk to a customer that that's, doesn't know very much about me and they've been kind of coached to, to not ask questions and to think potentially that me is unhealthy. So it's really, to me, the first step is creating trust. And so in doing that, my biggest goal is to create as many like direct information portals for the customer so they can just see for themselves how radically different that information is. So when they go to our website, they can see pictures of the farms. They welcome to visit the farms. They can stay overnight at the farm um, for $100 on our hip camp account. Like we're trying to say we have open doors, right? And we actually even let people visit the slaughterhouse. Um, we're, we're absolutely like, come see. You can walk around and see the chickens. This isn't a lockdown operation. So I'm trying in general to say we are radically transparent in everything that we do. And that's challenging. You know, this is one of the aspects of my business where I say, like, every day I realize why nobody does it this way. You know, it's challenging to, to try to provide all this level of information. And as I expand, I'm going beyond my own farm to working with multiple farms. And part of that is that I am going to bring some farms on that aren't organic, but they are becoming organic. So that adds another level of kind of like education and traceability, which is, yeah, this is, it's better in this case to buy non-organic certified, but regenerative product than it is to try, you know, to, to necessarily buy an organic certified product that has no regenerative practices. So there's a lot of like nuance and gray area in this um, that's different than what we see in the typical grocery environment. It's very interesting. So for somebody who's at a grocery store or searching online, if obviously if they go across your brand, they can have confidence, but if they're looking for other brands, how do they know? I mean, there's like this is stuff that's really challenging on packaging to have call outs because the USDA doesn't have regulations on regenerative things like that. Like, like what are the things to do? I mean, I always recommend knowing your farmer and asking questions, but if people don't have that luxury, like what are your sort of things to look for? Um, Absolutely look for the name of a real farm. That would be the first thing. Not just a company name on the package. 
And yeah, I would I would look for the name of a real farm or traceability to a real farm. That would be the top notch. Okay, and then visit that web you're at the farm at the grocery store, you got your phone, go to that farm's website and see what they say. Um, that's a really important first step. Um, number one thing, trigger for me, is companies that say farm in their title that don't actually have a farm uh. or are on a farm, like Creekstone Farms is in a farm. It's simply a packing house at a storage facility in the warehouse, right? So any company where their website quickly reveals that they call themselves a farm but they're not a farm, I'd say walk the other direction. Um, but so independent of like your sleuthing there, so empower yourself to sleuth and Google the names and visit the websites. Um, but in terms of labels, for beef, you should be looking for grass-fed and finished. Um, most meat in America is grass-fed because at some point in its life, it's fed on a grass diet. But grass finishing is what's truly costly for the beef producer to get the final months of the animal fully fattened out on grass. And also, more importantly, it's been documented that it has a very important impact on the animal's omega-3 to omega-6 ratio. Mm-hmm. So that's a really important thing for your human health is that our meat is at a one to 1.7 as of last month, omega-3 to omega-6 ratio on average. Conventional feedlot beef is one to 20 to one to 30. So you have just a vastly different human health impact in terms of the omega-3 to 6 ratio of the meat. Yeah. And so, I mean, obviously that stuff isn't public. And we were chatting, I think it was in Santa Monica, you were telling me that there's a lot of you know farms that say they're grass fed, grass finished, even that aren't very clear and, and use grass pellets and all this other stuff and aren't aren't what you think they would be. Yeah, grass finishing is an unregulated term, um, so that means there's no kind of there's not much guidance about when and how you can use it. Uh, it can be um, it can be abused, right? And people do get around it by saying it's grass finished, but they're actually using grass seed pellets. I think that's probably the smaller problem to worry about. Um, I think the bigger problem is, the bigger way to solve for that is look for the name of a legitimate farm on it. Um, And, you know, if you're looking for, the other thing to note too, just for your education is I think 93, 94% of grass-fed and finished meat sold in America is international in origin. Wow, I had no idea it was that high. Yeah. Um, and that's because it's a lot cheaper to produce grass fed and finished meat in Australia and South America where they have intact pastures. But it does add a level kind of, of complexity around what your security is for the food chain, food supply. So I can say with security that, it, you know, that probably you're seeing a grass fed and finished product that's lower cost. It's most likely that it's from Australia, New Zealand, or um, Uruguay. Um, probably not that they're falsifying that, this source of feed. Um, that is more likely to happen in the U S where it's more expensive to get access to grass than it is in other countries. Right. Uh, is it possible to have a regenerative dairy farm and use ethical practices there? Wow. That's a great question. So that's a really big issue because of the lactation cycle of animals. So animals naturally cows will naturally be in lactation for five to seven months of the year. The American dairy system's productivity is predicated on year-round lactation, which is why the average dairy cow in the U.S. has a lifespan of about um, three years compared to 15 years in Europe, because they're lactating all the time. And any woman who breastfed can tell you, myself included, that's no fun. Um, you know, you, you typically will lactate as a human for maximum a year, and any more than that, and you're going to start to see you know, hair loss. And same thing with women who have kids multiple years in a row. It's very, very hard in your body. So the dairy industry is basically keeping females in, in constantly impregnated and then hormonally constantly stimulated to lactate. So the problem, first off, is the animal welfare piece of the dairy industry is, is challenging because of that. That's also just as a fun aside, if people ever ask you, oh, you know, this dairy animal meat is so good in Europe, and I wish we did it here, right? If you've heard that before, because dairy meat is really incredibly different in Europe, and you can get some of the best steaks you've ever eaten from, like, 20-year-old cows. And people ask, like, why is that so different? It's like, well, because they don't milk as much hard. They don't push them as hard during their life, so they can accumulate some really delicious intramuscular fat instead of pushing that out all in the form of liquid milk like we make do in the U.S., so the number one issue with regenerative and dairy farming is just that the cost would be so radically different because then the production around milk is so, the requirements around milk production are so different. So that's like, you know, the, the, the number one issue you have to overcome is seasonal lactation. There are some farms that are doing it, but the price differential is really extreme. 
the other issue is that just like with corn finishing um, beef, uh, corn finish is a, a great way to get a lot of fast weight gain and fast fat gain, right? But it also, you know, requires a heavy nutritional load. Same thing, think about breastfeeding, you need to eat more calories. So doing that on a, a grain ration um, is going to be a bit more efficient for different grain producers. There are a number of dairies, like Organic Valley has an incredible grass milk line, which we buy and I love as a product. Um, Alexander Dairy is doing, uh, it's like a California brand, um, a, a sorghum and grass finish product. So they're out there. It's probably less than, like, I'd say like 2%, 1% of the dairy industry is doing that. Um, so you, if you're going to be looking for a widely available brand that I would consider broadly like a regenerative product, I would look for Organic Valley's grass milk line or find a, a local dairy that's feeding a mix of grass and silage. And that's going to be the closest kind of hack that you can get to a regenerative um, kind of system. It's a, it's a lot easier to make. The biggest kind of like problem areas with beef in terms of regenerative farming is the, the food stuff. It's growing corn to feed them. Um, it's not as much about the methane and things. Um, it, it's about growing corn to feed them. The other issue is that when they're in density, there's lots of methane emissions that are concentrated. So when they're out of pasture and they're being fed a natural feed, you've got the kind of groundwork done for a regenerative approach with beef and dairy or meat industry. Right. So, so far as I understand it too, like the the problem of methane is not so much the farts and the burps. It's when they're combined so close together and then it can't the manure basically can't incorporate into the soil exactly. a little better. So it just creates these large pits of is fermenting exactly it's the same thing as you know here in my garden in, in california if i had somebody dump off a pile of you know one cubic ton of manure and left it in my yard for a month my neighbors would complain but they have no problem with me getting a ton of manure dumped and me spreading it out in my garden beds and over you know like if it's spread out it's fine after a week it doesn't smell anymore and got a beautiful garden if you leave it in a big stinky pile and it flies it's gonna be disgusting right so it's all about the density Right, that creates problems. Yeah. Right. Uh, what are your thoughts on carnivore diet as it stands right now? Um, you know, I've done it a number of times, so I've cycled through it on and off. Uh, I think, I think like keto, um, it, if you're on a, if you're looking to make a radical change, it's a great way to kind of break through in the same way that even like a juice cleanse or vegan cleanse can do that. You know, not to confound those two, you know, a lot more about nutrition than me. Um, I think it's a great way to kind of like break set to, to get, you know, a different type of energy um, to shake things up in your body. I, I also love that people... Pardon me, who are doing it are experimenting things with awful, like and eating more marrow bones and lots of delicious incorporations that are also just great for your health, right? And incorporating bone broth on a daily basis. Um, I'd say I do like a low key carnivore, I'm like 80% carnivore, uh, which is a diet that I really thrive on. I think, especially for women, um, in, you know, in my like. I'd say from my late 30s onwards, I was feeling just more, you know, you, you're keeping your vitality up is, is, the, is the challenge, right, in, the, in this age bracket. And I find that the, the high animal fat and the organs that are a really crucial part for me to achieve that vitality naturally. So I think if carnivore is a pathway to get you oh, yeah. there, absolutely. I think it's a, a magic diet for people with some specific issues like psoriasis and skin and inflammatory issues that are just perennial and will not go away. It seems to be a real goal to take care of those issues. Um, I don't know if it's something that I'd say broadly is going to be applicable in terms of like big transformation potential for that and people who don't have those specific issues. Does that make sense for you? Yeah, totally. Um, it, one question too that I've just been curious about. So I was just like peppering with all this random stuff right now. But um, I've, I've just read, like, read some studies around pig and chicken polyunsaturated fat content in sort of indigenous cultures around two to three percent, very similar to beef. Um, and then sort of modern animals of you know in a Western culture being more like twenty to thirty percent poof of content of the fat. Just curious if you guys have done any analysis on yours or where you think that. Oh my God, but no, I'm going to send an email right now to my testing agency and get this done. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I'm really yeah. curious about that because like, I think that there's a there's a, a lot that's going to be coming out as we sort of, I think keto opened up a lot, but now that people are eating more fat, I just see 
some people responding well to keto and some not. And when that happens, it's generally because of vegetable oil and PUFA, linoleic acid in particular. Oh, wow. Is okay, that makes sense. High, that it, it actually stimulates um, insulin resistance as a signaling molecule. And so this is just like sort of curious. Like I, I'm, I'm starting to wonder like, yes, these animals are monogastric. We need to like be sure what we're feeding them is the appropriate species-specific diet. But like, do we also just select animals over the course of thousands of years that got fatter quicker and that fat has a little bit more um, of this sort of predisposition towards maybe linoleic and arachidonic acid specifically? So super curious. That's really interesting. I will send you those tests when I get them done. I'll get those done immediately. Because that's kind of a missing element. I mean, for beef, it's... I know there's some people out there like, oh, grass-fed and corn finish are exactly the same in terms of human health. And there's great research out of Chico State that refutes that really conclusively. That's very, you know, well-documented, peer-reviewed studies. So that's BS. It's very different for you nutritionally. And my own studies, I work with a, a lab that does third-party testing on all of our products, um, and that is also support. We, we test our products every couple months and we also pull a set of products from the grocery store and have them test a competitive set just to make sure that we're outperforming. I do that on beef though. I don't have any metrics for my other species um, because I just, it's been unclear for me what to test for. Um, I, I can say circumstantially that my pork has a lot more fat, but I, it's hard to know about it. It doesn't have the higher omega-3 ratio, but I want to check on the PUFAs. I can get that pulled and tested. It would make sense. I mean, most pigs are fed in conventional diet, primarily soy. Right. Which is incredibly high in linoleic acid specifically. Yeah. And we don't, I mean, we use a mixed ration, primarily barley, and our animals are also out at forage and they get somewhere between five and 15% of their calories, depending on the season, you know, if it's in the wintertime, less so obviously, um, but from other, from just natural vegetable sources. So the natural high in omega-3s. Yeah. But that would, you know, there's a, there's absolutely a strong, um, inflammatory response. Like I personally, if I eat conventional pork, have a massive inflammatory response. I'll get extremely ill um, from that. I've experienced that before. Um, and I, you know, I was a judge for years on Iron Chef America. So even though I'm pretty rigid about my food consumption and sources, I've had plenty of experiences where I haven't been able to be because I'm like on national TV eating everything. Um, so in those, I've eaten enough of everything to know like, yeah, pork can be awful for your system and it's and, but our pork is fine so i know it's different like in terms of how i experience it but i just assumed that was free range and slower growing that were part of that i didn't really think about the inflammatory markers as being something to test for yeah i mean i feel the same way if i eat bad quality chicken or pork and vegetable oils which for me is like within a few hours to the next like 24 hours i feel way more lethargic and brain foggy mm -hmm. yeah. that's sort of like how i respond to it yeah and yeah i haven't been able to find many sources that haven't made me feel like that. So I just sort of skipped that and gone. I mean, I mean, it's a good thing about even if you do get green grain finished cows is that the way that their digestion works, you're not going to get a high, like more than 3% PUFA concentration. No, yeah, no, yeah. That's, that's, that's fair. But that's fair. Yeah. It's all, another thing that you make me think of that I, I think about like, it's kind of like a key health hack in this is like, you know, you look at how much of American meat has some sauce on it. Right. Like it's all, we're so sauce dependent and marinade dependent and all those sauces, especially if they're prefabricated and pre-made have, are entirely dependent on, um, on highly processed vegetable oils. Um, and, so, and corn syrup usually. It's, it's yeah. Like, it's like such a, it's such a toxic cocktail. It's like highly processed corn syrup, sugar, um, and soy. Right. And you put that. And so I think with cleaning up your meat too, it's like, Hey, if, if really clean meat's out of reach financially for you right now, um, I would say just ditch the teriyaki bottle marinade, you know, but the problem is that then those meats kind of need it because they don't taste like much by the end of themselves. Whereas my meats, like you just throw my meat on a pan with some salt. You can attest to this. And it's pretty damn good. Right. Yeah. Um, you don't really need anything. I think if you have to marinate your steak, you should upgrade your steak, right? Like you shouldn't have to marinate a steak. Um, it should taste so good with just salt on it. Um, yeah. But anyways, I do think that if you're looking to like, if you're having inflammatory response to meat, the number one thing I'd say is just throw out any and all pre-made sauces and marinades. If you want to use a marinade, use high quality olive oil, some good um, vinegar, you know, a little bit of coconut sugar if you need to, right? Like, because the prefabricated sauces and marinades are just totally reliant effectively on, on really, really highly processed oils. 
Yeah. I mean, soybean oil, yeah. like 99% of the time for sure. Well, I learned this when I cleaned out our restaurants. So, you know, our restaurants, we started to pivot more and more towards wellness, which is just like amazing. That's, you know, my passion and interest in this too. It was like, this is so fun. Great. Let's just like, let's just do this right on. You know, like get in there and, and like, let's get all the, anything with canola oil out, right? Get, make sure there's no canola oil in your, you know, potato buns, make sure there's no canola oil in any sauces that you're using in any dishes. And we did it, but it was extremely hard to find replacements at any scale. So we ended up having, we have a commissary kitchen, so we ended up making things like mayonnaise ourselves because we can't buy food service mayonnaise made with verified avocado oil um, or good olive oil. So that was a really big learning for me. And that actually changed my response to restaurants because I'm like, well, I don't really, knowing now how hard it is to get clean ingredients in food service, I, I'm going to really be much more cautious about any kind of claims and, and ingredients in, that are made casually in restaurants and everywhere. Yeah, I mean, same thing you're mentioning before around dairy being sort of a fixed cost, this artificial production. The, the same thing happens with restaurant prices because if you want people to have anything that's fried or uses any type of oil, that's all priced at soybean and canola and peanut oil prices. Exactly. Brings it down incredibly low. Yeah. Uh, and it, yeah, it's just challenging to be able to offer anywhere near the same product for a restaurant. It's like, I, I totally understand when, when restaurants use it. I mean, it's just a sort of a financial thing. You can't be in business pretty much. Well, that's one of the reasons why I'm looking forward to e-commerce growing for my business, because I can't tell you how many reviews I get that are like, the French fries are so expensive. And I'm like, I say, yeah, my margins, I make half the money that anybody else makes on those fries. I know this from comparing my cost of goods to other restaurants that I work with and know, like our costs are double right? It's crazy. And so it's, you know, when you're using good, you're really disincentivized to use high quality, clean ingredients in the restaurant industry, unfortunately. Um, and you think about it, it's like part of the crisis that's happening in restaurants with COVID is in, in, in part because it's such a difficult industry. The expectations are that everything's going to be heck of cheap and competitive and cooked for you and served to you. And what the only thing you can really give on is, is what you're, what you're putting in, in, the, in the food. You know, the, the regulations around what you pay your laborer are fair and just and, and should be there, right? But there's no regulations on all everything. What, what can you actually, um, what can you cut on? You can't typically negotiate rent that's different from anybody else, right? So you really, that's one of the few areas where people can actually kind of cut out the optics of the offering being destroyed. If it were easy, I think everybody would do it. I think that we yeah. can all share that. Yeah. <laughs> no. Thank you so much for coming on and chatting about that stuff. Where can people find everything else that you're doing as well as the company? Belcampo.com. Buy some meat online. And I, I and we're going to hook you up with a discount code. And, and then also, I believe if you're not already set up for us to be getting um, regular product, I, I want you on that roster. Awesome. Well, to appreciate it. Personal yeah. meat sponsor. We will make sure to get that code out in the in the show notes and everything as well for people. Who Amazing. Are... Cool. All right. Thank you so much for coming on today. Okay, I want to hang out again. Let me know when you're in California. Whenever we can travel. Okay, talk to you soon, man. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Natural State Podcast. Hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, I'd really appreciate you heading over to whatever service you're listening to this podcast on, dropping me a five-star review and your thoughts on the show. This helps us get discovered by more people and spreading the good gospel of health. And if you want to stay plugged into all of my self-health experiments, recent research in books that I'm reading and my interpretations of those things, products that I'm testing and thoughts on all things related to health, check out my free weekly newsletter called The Feed. You can sign up for that at dranthonygustin.com slash The Feed. That's dranthonygustin.com slash The Feed. Thanks again for tuning in and your support of the Natural State Podcast.